Here's what's coming up in this episode of the Summit for Wellness podcast. When I ask somebody, why do you want to lose weight? They, they're, they stutter. They're like, what? I, well, everybody wants to lose weight. What kind of question is that? It's like I asked them, why do they want to take their next breath? And you go, no, seriously, tell me what's going to happen. Your loved ones are not going to love you anymore. Your loved ones, the people who already love you, your friends, your family, your partner, they're not going to love you any more than they already love you because you're down a, a pant size or two pant sizes. There's nothing observable. If some anthropologist was watching you from behind a, a human blind, like a duck blind, they wouldn't be able to write in their notes. And this thing happened and then this creature became stressed out. All you did is think. You thought some thoughts and now you've convinced yourself that something is true and now you're miserable. From an intrinsic motivation, you would be able to say, yeah, I look better. I do look better naked. I do look better in my, in my bikini. But that is one thing on a list that also includes, I feel better, I perform better, I sleep better, I have a better sex drive, better digestion, no headaches, I, I, uh, I'm, but my mood is better pretty much all of the time, my energy levels are consistent, I can do these hobbies that I had to give up because they exhausted me too much, I can work in my garden all day and it doesn't destroy a whole weekend. You got this huge list of things and one little thing on that list is that you look better. You can't hate a body beautiful, and yet it's going to war with your body is the MO for most women in the Western world. And the data backs that up 100%. Something like 73% of women are, up, are, are unhappy enough with some part of their body that they are actively trying to change it at this exact moment. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. You know, sometimes that beat is just so catchy that I sit here and I dance in my chair to it. Um, I love that intro. It's just so fun. Uh, today, we welcome you back to the Summit for Wellness podcast. We have been um, gone for a couple weeks. We've had a lot going on on the back end here at, at the clinic. Um, and last time, we spoke with the one and only Joel Salatin. So if you missed that episode, I highly recommend going back and listening to it. Joel was just a, so much fun to talk to, and it's fun to sit down and talk with a farmer and talk about where the heck our food comes from and what we can do to make sure that the food that's on our dinner tables is the highest quality food that we can have. But today, today we have... a uh, fantastic guest that's from the Pacific Northwest here, and we will be talking all about uh, body image and fat loss for women, and I think it's a pretty powerful um, movement that he's trying to create for women because he is an outsider looking in, and what I mean by that is his practice and what he is surrounded by is like 90% women. So he gets to see all these different um, elements in a woman's life that holds them back from being able to achieve their goals or to um, be successful. And he's able to come in from a different vantage point and talk about just what he has seen and what he has seen that works and what doesn't work. And to give advice on how to change the mindset of women and how they should view themselves and all sorts of different things. And a lot of the passion that comes from this is that he is surrounded by women at home, too. So he's got three little girls. He has his wife. So he's just completely immersed in this um, this realm of being a female in this type of society and how 
how so many females sit there and judge themselves based off of social media, off of what they see in the mirror, and just how they talk to themselves. And so it's it's a pretty pretty interesting topic to go into. And I think for a lot of women, you might sit there and be like, well, you're a male, you don't understand. But sometimes it's good to get that outside perspective for things and to come at things with a, a little different viewpoint and a little different um, eye in order to see like, well, if if something's not working the way that it that I've tried it, maybe I should try something else. Or maybe it's it's a viewpoint that I'm not seeing and maybe I need to look at it different. So I think it's I think it's a really important message to get out there, especially to the younger women um, coming up through the schools and getting into their 20s where there is a lot of self-doubt and a lot of, um, you know, just body shaming and thinking you're not good enough. I think this is a message that uh, these women and young girls really need to um, start looking at and taking into effect in their lives and it comes from the brain it really comes from the mind and how we perceive things and uh, being able to shut out a lot of that um, inner voice noise that just talks us down um, all day long and to try and fill that that space with something a lot more positive so uh, Jason side will go a lot more into that he's a, a phenomenal speaker about it and like I said he's super passionate about it which um, makes it that much more um, accessible because he has so many different analogies that he's able to use and to bring into the picture here. So I'm really excited to share this with you guys and hopefully you can share it to the people in your lives that you think need this the most. Okay, before we get to the show, let's just talk about um, Thrive Market just briefly. Uh, if you go to summitforwellness.com slash thrive, you can get 25% off of your first order um, from Thrive Market, and they will ship directly to your door any health food that you may want or need. Take advantage of that while we have it. Uh, once again, it's 25% off at summitforwellness.com slash thrive. Okay, Let's get to the show and let's listen to what Jason Saib has to say. Okay, welcome back to the Summit for Wellness podcast. Today we are going to be talking about body image and awareness from um, a health author named Jason Saib. And he is the creator of the popular Alt Shift Diet. And he's the author of the Body Beliefs book for women, weight loss, and happiness. He's also the co host of the popular Alt Shift podcast. He is a national speaker, trainer, and a fat loss coach. His passion is guiding normal people to extraordinary levels of health and fitness, marrying his extensive knowledge of fitness and nutrition with his love of psychology. He has built his career by helping thousands of women change their perspective and find a healthy, sustainable path to their goals. Welcome, Jason, to the show. Thanks, Brian. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hey Jason, I just wanted to briefly talk about your background since you've been in the health and fitness industry for so long. Can you take us back to how you got started in this industry and what brought you to this point? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the short version is because um, it's it's obviously a, a a story spanning a couple of decades now. But I uh, I I was a, a one of those typical rotten kids got into all the wrong stuff by the time I was a teenager and coming out of my teenage years and into my early twenties, uh, needed a a change pretty desperately found a, uh, actually I was found by a bodybuilder friend of mine who taught me how to work out. And I pretty much immediately became more of the geek side than the gym rat side. And I started really looking into, um, all of the science behind, uh, all the, you know, all the things like fitness and nutrition and, you know, everything from what causes hypertrophy and, and how metabolisms work and all that stuff. And we're talking, you know, mostly pre-internet days going all the way back to like having to go to the library and go look at microfish and things like that. And um, I, it, it didn't really become my primary source of income until uh, I guess we're looking at like something like 
12, 11, 12 years ago now. And uh, the gym scene sort of changed and um, I, I became a trainer. And then you fast forward and I end up with an uh, my own gym and then an online presence. And then uh, my first book was in the paleo world. And then uh, since then we've got alt shift and body beliefs and uh online training programs and and coaching and a, a huge portion of what i do ends up being in the in the realm of weight loss and uh, psychology and and you know getting heads and perspectives right which i'm sure we're going to talk about a bunch today but um my clientele is gosh probably pretty close to around 90 percent women um almost all being frustrated yo-yo dieters who have have done a lot of different things and had really bad relationships with their bodies throughout the course of their lives and um i have i'm i'm married also with three little girls so i'm my whole world is basically spent looking at and helping women with the, these issues that's definitely one of the things we're going to talk about with women and body image, and we're going to look at it from kind of an outside view looking in because we're not so much affected by uh, a lot of that realm, but we definitely see what's going on when we're on the outside. But yeah, it's given me a really, really unique perspective because uh, it, I, I can, I find that I can see so many things really clearly and then help women understand them because there's no, I can look at them without emotion. And so it really has, it's been a negative and a positive to be a male in this realm because sometimes women will shut me out and go, you're not a man. You couldn't possibly know what, what this is like. But I think that once I start talking to them about some of these perspectives that they can go, you know, because like you and I, we can look at pictures in say a magazine ad of a man's abs and we're not going to think of our own abs in most cases. I mean, I could flip through a magazine and briefly see a male model, and I'm not going to think of my own body. That is completely 100% abstract to the average woman. Like the average woman would, they will overhear a conversation about somebody else talking about how so-and-so's butt got bigger and immediately think about their butt and then spend time thinking about their butt for some predetermined amount of time, depending on what, what their body image is like. So, I mean, these differences between the men and women, it's, it's, it's fairly astonishing. And I think that the, the outside perspective lets me look at it almost from an anthropological perspective. Like I don't have to have the emotions so I can just look at the logic. So a lot of this came from one of your programs that you have, which is the Alt Shift Diet Community. Can you talk about that and how that was able to bring light to this body belief system that you've come up with? Yeah, yeah. I've been saying for a, a few years now, well, probably a good half a dozen years now that my job wasn't about bodies, it's about heads. Um, and Alt Shift really sealed the deal for that. The Alt, Alt Shift is a diet protocol that I created that has been hugely successful it's done amazing things we've got a massive community behind it we've sold tons of books it, and it, it it works like nothing else i've ever used in my career but it doesn't seem to really matter what the protocol is a minimum of 80 percent of the people who try anything are still going to fail and that's what really sealed the deal for me that i had to write body beliefs was that Everybody that was doing alt shift and just applying themselves to it was going, I, I love it. I'm getting, I got great results. Uh, I, 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 it was easy. I felt like I could do it forever and I quit anyway. And now I'm having a really hard time getting back on track and I don't know why I do these things. So we had to start digging into things like intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations and, and, um, you know, internal and external loci of control and uh, self-sabotage and that thing where people say that they deserve a reward or, or a treat when they've been good for a while or that one bite won't hurt mentality. And so I've got a good friend, uh, Robert Beeswas Diener, who is a, um, a, a positive psychologist in, in the coaching world and um, big name psychologist and done some really awesome things. And he and I have been sitting down for getting close to four years now, um, at least a couple times a month, but oftentimes weekly. 
and just brainstorming these things and, and hammering out why this stuff happens. And, you know, the, the average woman is, is in a situation in which, well, let me give you an example that I, I, I gave on uh, the Rob Wolf podcast recently. It, it's like, do you, do you have kids, Brian? Not yet. Okay. Well, let's say you did and you, in order to raise this child to the best of your ability, you got up every morning and your methodology, first thing in the morning, get up, go to the kid, look the kid in the eye and go, you just disgust me. You, every time I look at you, you disgust me. I want to wear around other kids. I, I feel like you probably can't even change and you're never going to be as good as those other kids. And you're always just going to be a disappointment. If you did that with a child, you would absolutely destroy that child. You would create nothing that looked like a, an amazing human and especially not anything that created that, that looked like it would create beauty. And yet this is exactly how most women are trying to create beauty in themselves. They're in the mirror in the morning, brushing their teeth, looking at their bodies, picking out all the things that are wrong with them, telling themselves how they need to be doing the next thing, but it probably won't work because of all the other things that I've already tried. And maybe I'm just not one of those people who gets results. How come I got dealt such bad cards? How come I have to suffer through this? How come the world is forcing me to change the way I look so that they'll just like me? I just wish they would just like me for who I am. This is the mentality that most women are using in order to try to create something beautiful. And the analogy is kind of like, like um, Michelangelo approaching that big block of granite to carve David. And he's going to do that with hate and bitterness and loathing and sadness. And out of that is going to come the beautiful statue of David. And it's just, there's just no chance. There's no possible way. You can't hate a body beautiful. And yet it's going to war with your body is the MO for most women in the Western world. And the data backs that up 100%. Something like 73% of women are, up, are, are unhappy enough with some part of their body that they are actively trying to change it at this exact moment. That's, that, that's so sad. I mean, if you're anything like me and the average male, you think about your butt when it's sore from doing squats. And <laughs> that's about the only time. And, and for women, they think about their bodies and various parts of their bodies analytically and critically, and usually in a negative light, usually multiple times in a day, oftentimes multiple times in an hour. And that's just heartbreaking to me. It's, it's devastating, but this is this uh, alas, this is the, the place that we find ourselves. The powerful thing about that is you talking about, we can't negative negatively shame ourselves into beauty. And even if we have what everyone else would assume would be the most perfect body, we still find ways to bring ourselves down. And there was a, a few studies done that took a bunch of people um, and they took what their ideal image of what the perfect body would look like and they would take pictures of them and Photoshop that type of body onto them. Mm -hmm. And even though these people now have these amazing bodies, they would still pick apart like, oh, that ab is a little off center or whatnot. They would still right. find reasons to shame themselves. Absolutely, yeah. And the research like that is is overwhelming. I mean, there's... There's so many situations in which we can prove that when you dislike yourself and you think you're going to change your body and then like yourself, that you've got the cart before the horse and that's a pipe dream. It's, as a matter of fact, not only the data, but the real world experience. I mean, if you look around, point to, to somebody just I, I just want to I just want to find this unicorn of a person that hated their body, made it smaller, and now absolutely loves it and is no longer insecure about their body. That that person does not exist. But the people who fix their heads and then get to work on their bodies, those people get sustainable results. 
those people get results that last a lifetime. So it's like the, the idea that, that, that you should go spend multiple decades of an adult life trying to change a body in order to feel better, in order to, you know, you always hear, well, what would happen if you lost weight? Well, I'd be more confident, you know, statements like that that are just, come on, no, you wouldn't. That's, that is such crap. You're going to pull out a magnifying glass and step closer to the mirror. That's all that's going to happen. But the, the idea that you can do that and then work so hard for so many years trying everything under the sun, but not do anything to work on the perspective that drives it all, the, the head that controls whether or not you ever get results is it's just, it makes me want to scream and shake people because it's, it just, it doesn't, when you stop and think about it, it just doesn't make sense for one of the reasons that give you just a quick example of why people are always going to fail with that extrinsic motivation is when you're doing this, from a, from an extrinsic place, it means you would never do any of this on a desert island. You'd never try to make any of these changes because there'd be nobody around to judge you. So screw it. And the only reason you're doing any of it is because you want other people to approve of the way you look. So that's an, uh, the, the pure definition of an extrinsic motivation. When you've got an extrinsic motivation, the motivation isn't, I want to look better. It's, I want those people to like me more. I'm being forced to do this because they won't just like me anyway. So if you had a genie, you could rub a lamp and a genie would pop out. The wish would be, I wish everybody just thought that my body now was perfect instead of making me have to do all these things I hate because you dislike doing all of the steps because none of it's intrinsic. You're not eating this meal because it's good for you because you deserve it. You're eating this meal because if you stack enough of these meals up in a row, something will happen and then you can go jump on the scale and see if it quote unquote worked. But the, the gist is that if when you're extrinsically motivated like that, and you're doing everything for everybody else, it isn't gonna be very long before life literally forces you to be selfish. The next stress event is coming. You're going to wreck a car, lose a job, lose a relationship, lose a loved one, something, and life will force you to be selfish and you will put yourself first and you will throw everybody else out for a while and you'll be, the heck with all those people, I don't have time to make them happy right now and you're gonna eat whatever's in front of you because you didn't wanna eat that healthy food anyway, you were only doing it to make those people happy and now those people don't count. So uh, let alone all of the myriad temptations, the maybe dozens of temptations that will cross your path every single day that you have to try to get around when you don't want to get around those things. All you want is smaller pants. You don't want to have to not eat cheesecake. You don't want to have to eat, you know, drink a black coffee instead of a Starbucks caramel macchiato. You want to do all those things, but in the moment that you're looking in the mirror, you slightly more want to have uh, a, a smaller pant size or a smaller number on the scale, those temptations are going to come up by the dozens every single day. And you're going to have to try to get around all of those with a motivation that isn't based on anything you are doing for you. That There's no possible way you can win that fight. I've never seen it happen. Not once. So that brings up a good point. How do you then take that and... Uh, utilize that so that you are more successful? Well, the first thing you need to do is figure out that your, your goals don't really mean anything. You <laughs> think about this for a second. When, when I ask somebody, why do you want to lose weight? They, they're, they stutter. They're like, Whoa. I, well, everybody wants to lose weight. What kind of question is that? It's like, I asked them, why do they want to take their next breath? And you go, no, seriously, tell me what's going to happen. Your loved ones are not going to love you anymore. Your loved ones, the people who already love you, your friends, your family, your partner, they're not going to love you any more than they already love you because you're down a, a pant size or two pant sizes. And so if you were to rapidly gain weight, they might be concerned. If you were to lose weight in a noticeable, no, noticeable rate, they might be like, oh, good for you. But they're not going to love you anymore. So your concern is entirely for the fringe people. And this is a really difficult aspect for women because women are hardwired to create social bonds. When we see, we see infants 
back, you know, all the way at like two weeks old, female infants are analyzing faces more than men. They're already developing more emotional intelligence. Then they hit puberty and they rank themselves based on how popular they are. Whereas boys are literally trying to rank themselves. They're throwing elbows. They're playing sports. They're, they're sometimes literally fighting. They talk trash in ways that the women could never get away with. And the, so the two, the two forms of ranking themselves is really stacks against the women in this case because they're ranking themselves based on how many people like them. They're out there trying to please people. So they get into this perspective that the, the, uh, the more people that like me, the better off I am. And then out at those fringe people, outside the loved ones, but the fringe people, the people that you see at work that you'd never see again if you quit your job, maybe at your church or whatever hobbies or whatever you're involved with, those people are the entirety of what they're worried about. If I looked better, those people wouldn't judge me. But those people, you have no idea whether or not those people are judging you anyway. And to walk into a room and look around and say, I look like crap, and all of these people know that I look like crap is being horribly rude to those people. I mean, think about it. You're standing in a room. Somebody walks in, looks at you. You can read that person's mind and that person's mind is saying, that Brian guy right there just looked at me and thought, she's fat and now I don't want to be her friend. I mean, like, you'd be like, are, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not, what kind of judgmental jerk are you taking me for? But that's what, those are the kinds of assumptions that everybody's making, even though they're not doing that. You know, they're not looking around the world going, that person over there's fat and I don't want to be their friend. They're not doing that. But the assumption is that everybody else is doing it. And then when we look at those fringe people, really the only thing that's going to come out of it is either they are going to walk by you in a hallway and say, Hey, you look like you lost some weight and that will be over forever. They will never say it again. Or you would have to admit that you are dying to make these people your friend, but they're resisting solely because you're not small enough. And now that you're smaller, they will want to be your friend. When you realize that that's not true and that the only benefit that's going to come out of this is that some people are going to walk by you and say that you look like you lost weight, then you can look at what you would get from an intrinsic motivation. From an intrinsic motivation, you would be able to say, yeah, I look better. I do look better naked. I do look better in my, in my bikini. But that is one thing on a list that also includes, I feel better. I perform better. I sleep better. I have a better sex drive, better digestion, no headaches. And I, I, uh, I'm, but my mood is better pretty much all of the time. My energy levels are consistent. I can do these hobbies that I had to give up because they exhausted me too much. I can work in my garden all day and it doesn't destroy a whole weekend. You got this huge list of things and one little thing on that list is that you look better. To give you an analogy of this, another thing that you're intrinsically motivated to do is take a shower. You would take a shower, like if you go camping and, you're, and you're, you haven't showered for, for a week, when you come home, you don't have to get back in the swing of taking a shower or start showering again next Monday. I'll start again on Monday is always what we say about diets. And you, but yet showering is something you do totally intrinsically. You would do it on a desert island if there was a shower around and nobody else was around. You would still take a shower unless for some reason you slipped into a deep depression. But you don't shower for other people. One of the benefits is that you smell good after you shower and it makes it so that you are more attractive. But it's not the only reason that you do it and you don't need other people to be around in order for you to continue to do it. You don't need people to walk up and tell you how great it is that you've been showering re regularly. So you analyze your fat loss goals and realize how basically vapid and shallow they are. There's nothing left. I'm not saying the person is vapid and shallow. I'm saying the goal has no s substance to it. There's nothing really there. You're going, when I lose weight, everything will be great. And then somebody like me goes, why? And you can't explain it. They're not going to kick in your door and throw money at you and make you date supermodels. But literally a couple of people are going to tell you that you look like you lost weight. If your relationships are crappy, losing weight is not going to make them better. And if your relationship is amazing, then you're probably ignoring somebody in your life who tells you all the time that you're beautiful, writing it off going, oh, he has to say that to me. While you worry about all these people out on the fringe, you punish, you know, husband or partner for 
for, for their positive opinion of you so that you can worry about people that don't really matter. I mean, when you really analyze this stuff, an intrinsic motivation has all of this depth and substance to it that a extrinsic motivation does not have. You've just been spending your life convincing yourself that, that those motivations are somehow super valuable. Once you realize that you can logically and mindfully, and I preach a lot of meditation, start to change those thoughts. Is it easy? No, it's super, super hard. It's super hard because you've spent years of your life myelinating pathways in your brain that make you automatically think things like, I just walked into a party, everybody thinks I'm fat, I need to leave. You've spent years practicing that. You're really good at it. Now you have to mindfully practice something else. And I wrote up in Body Beliefs on exactly how to do that. It's, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna ramble a lot here if I try to get into too much of that. But there's the gist. So even when people feel these um, intrinsic motivations and they feel successful in that, they start to feel better, their digestion's working better, what makes them fall off the bandwagon? Because you see a lot of these type of programs, people will go a couple months, feel great, and then all of a sudden just drop off and disappear and then have to retry in like a year or two. Why yeah. does this happen? Well, usually it's because they've, they've started to get all those amazing results, but their, their motivations weren't intrinsic there was still all these other things that that they that they were doing those motivations for that weren't coming true for them but to start at the very beginning none of us are supposed to have to do any of this none of i mean I, those of us that eat healthy foods instead of eating the most highly palatable foods and those of us who purposely get up and go exercise like going for a walk in a great big circle without ever actually going to a destination, just going for a walk or going to a gym and picking up heavy things that aren't doing actual work, productive work. We're the weirdos. The, and the reason why is because we are going against everything that our bodies are programmed to do. We all operate under optimum foraging strategy like virtually every other animal out there. And optimum foraging strategy says, find the most highly palatable food you can that requires the least amount of energy expenditure to get it. And then once you eat it, put as much of it in your face as you can and then sit down. And that is how our, our hunter gatherer ancestors existed for the entire 2.6 million years that our species has been under development. It's that, that is the norm, but what our environment does not create anymore is health. See, if you go to a jungle in Asia, and you capture a tiger, if that jungle was, uh, you know, a, a good environment for tigers, it had enough food, enough, just the right amount of other tigers for a, however social tigers need to be. I don't know. But, um, you know, ability to breed, not too many that they're getting beat up or losing food to other tigers and plenty of food, plenty of water, plenty of places to hide and nobody killing them. You, put, you catch a tiger, the odds of you catching any tiger and having it be a healthy tiger are really high because its environment produces health. And ours did too for all of those years. Highly palatable food, food that tasted really good in nature was food that was really good for you. And that's why we developed taste buds. We developed taste buds to be able to find nutrition in nature. So now we have foods like ice cream, that have pretty much zero nutritional value, but really high flavor. So you put ice cream in your mouth and your taste buds sense it, dopamine fires, and your brain says, this is really, really good for you. Do it again and do it as often as you possibly can. And the system is broken. Now you have been told to repeat something that is supposed to be good for you, but it's literally not even not good for you. It's literally bad for you. And you are now in, you find yourself in an environment where your gauges and your systems are all broken. The th same things that made it so that you and I can have this conversation because our ancestors survived to continue to become stronger and stronger as a species, those same things are now killing us. So why do people fall off the wagon? Well, I mean, people fall off the wagon because everything in their, in their body except their tiny little prefrontal cortex in the front of their brain, the, one of the most late developments in the human brain, everything besides that is telling them that what they're doing is wrong, that there is more palatable food. You can outsource your movement and sit on your butt. 
So people that are overweight aren't broken people that be, should be ashamed of themselves. They're amazing human specimens. They have bodies that did exactly what they were supposed to do to survive. It's not them that changed, it's our environment. And we broke our environment and those rules all changed. So people drop off, you know what I mean? And then, then you've got the little psychology issues. People will say things like, like here's one that everybody listening to this has said, including you and I, I'm sure we've, we've all said this. I've been so good on my diet, I deserve a treat. In other words, to phrase that a different way, I have done so good at this goal, I deserve to do the opposite of this goal. In Body Beliefs, the example I used was like saying, I have done such an amazing job cleaning my house, I deserve to throw a big handful of dirt on my living room floor. And yet, when you word it like that, it sounds insane. It's, it's like facetious and funny. But when you think about it, that is exactly what we're doing when we say those things. But our, 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 our minds, our inner voices come up with all kinds of reasons why we can sabotage ourselves, why we shouldn't believe we should be able to get results, why other people are obviously more special than us. You know, as soon as social comparison is in there, it gets really ugly. But the pitfalls are enormous. They're enormous and immense, and it takes a good headspace to make this stuff happen. So that was a really long answer for why uh, people are, are really likely to not be able to stick to virtually any protocol if their head isn't in the right place and why I promote so hard that people have to fix that aspect of it first. No, I think that was a fantastic answer for that question, actually. Perfect. Um, you've also talked about how, uh, this is kind of a, a practice, right? You're not going to be perfect at your Ooh. nutrition or dietary plan right off the bat. It's going to yes. take a while. Yeah, it, this is another thing about dieting, and again, it stems from the extrinsic motivations, but it's another thing about dieting that's just crazy. Extrinsic motivation leads, pe leads people to believe that they have to run at this thing and do everything perfectly, and so people diet like this. Let's use a music analogy. Let's say you were trying to learn how to play the violin, and you did it the same way you diet. What that would mean is that you would pick up the violin, you would start drawing the, the bow across the, the, the strings and you would hit a handful of notes and then you would hit a sour note. At that point, when you hit that sour note, you would put the violin back in its case, get mad at yourself, tell yourself that violin playing sucks, that you suck, everybody else must be better at playing violin than you, you weren't cut out to play this. Throw it, the case up in your closet and get mad at yourself for two to three weeks, maybe two to three months before you go back, pick up the violin and do the exact same thing. Play it for a few notes, hit a sour note, get mad and put it away. Whereas in reality, the way you would actually learn how to play a violin is you would try really hard not to hit sour notes, but every time you hit a sour note, you would continue to play and learn from that. So what that looks like in dieting is I am going to try to do, say you're doing a protocol like mine and you're working really hard at trying to get the right foods where they go in your diet and then you trip up and you make a mistake and it could be a mistake that is totally you just being a bonehead and being like, I, screw it right now and you're just being frustrated or whatever. The next meal is unaffected by what you just did. You've never, for example, taken a shower on a Monday morning because you took one on Sunday and because you know you're going to take one on Tuesday. They are all one-off events. Just like every meal, every walk, every time you go to bed on time, every time you meditate, all of these things that we do to try to make all this stuff happen all exist all by themselves. So what in the heck does lunch that is made up of pizza and beer have to do with dinner? But that's not the way people diet. If people make a mistake and do something like pizza and beer at lunch and they blow their diet, now we're looking out to the next Monday where we can start again, or we're just going to get mad and say that this isn't something that we're cut out for instead of just simply putting the next bite of food in your mouth and making it right. So practice is what it takes, but practicing like that is extremely hard to do with an extrinsic motivation because the extrinsic motivation says, I don't want to do any of this. I'm only doing it because the mass result of all of these things will add up to me looking better to other people. So one mistake 
seems to negate all of that. You've now blown it. So you go back to the starting line, you wait for a specific amount of time, and then you run as fast as you can and slam your face into that same obstacle again. And you do that over and over and over again. That's called yo-yo dieting. You spend a lifetime do it, doing it. Eventually enough age hits you and you get apathetic and go, screw it. I don't really care what I look like anymore. I just, I just want to be healthy. And then sometimes at that point, people can get on the right track. But even then, oftentimes people just start jumping from thing to thing about health or the motivation just isn't big enough. And overall, it adds up to a really crappy way to live in a body through a lifetime. It's just, it's, it's sad and heartbreaking, but it's all just perspective stuff. None of the things I'm talking about right now have to do, you know, people come to me and they go, Jason, I've hated my body my whole life. My wife, my, I mean, my mom taught me to, to, to hate my body by the time I was like six years old. I've had all of these uh, diets and, and emotional roller coasters, and I can't stand what I see in the mirror. And, and everything that I, that I do concerning my body, whenever I go shopping for clothes, go on vacation, it's all just heartbreaking. Can you tell me how many carbs to eat to fix that? <laughs> like, well, what? No, I can't. That's not the problem. You've got to change the opinion so that you can change the body. You're never going to change that body. Never until that head changes. Does that all make sense? Yeah, and that brings up a really good point I wanted to jump into is at what age do these um, beliefs start creeping into our mind and these negative impacts start creeping into our minds about ourselves? Well, I wrote in the beginning of Body Beliefs a story about a fictitious character named Jenny, and I loosely based her on stories from multiple clients. But in that story, Jenny is, you know, pretending to be a, a cat, a kitty, like, you know, my kids are constantly trying to be some sort of animal or something when they're little. And they crawling down the hallway into mom's room, see mom standing in the mirror with this frustrated look on her face, pinching the fat on her stomach. And Jenny goes, mom, what's, what, what's, what are you doing? And she goes, and mom says, nothing, sweetie, mom's just fat. And so Jenny pinches her own stomach and she feel, realizes that she can pinch up skin there too. So she feels like a big girl cause she's like her mom. And we jumped out ahead to, um, you know, puberty. And that's about the time that girls realize that, uh, other people might notice what they look like. And uh, if mom has oftentimes mom or sometimes just the lack of a presence of a dad or a dad that is that, that doesn't have a good filter on his mouth or deliberately insults her or other women's bodies in front of him, they've already got these kinds of things instilled, then it's oftentimes worse. But these girls go into uh, high school and they've already established that they're overweight and don't look good. So they've got headphones in their ears and they're looking at the ground and very much have this don't approach me mentality, trying to be not non-approachable. And the reason why is because if you come over here, uh, you might hurt me. So my wall is to be not approachable. So then they don't get asked out to prom and these other more outgoing girls do. And the girl that doesn't get asked out to prom thinks it's because I'm fat. She doesn't think it's because I believe that I'm fat. So I'm projecting onto the world. Don't come over here. I'm not worth your time or please leave me alone and don't hurt me. And so, you know, I, I've been thinking really hard lately and I'm trying really hard to figure out a way to get to that younger generation. I think it's through mothers and daughters together. There are a couple of chapters in body beliefs where we talk about things like attraction and sexuality comes up just on that scientific level of course not you know it's never like inappropriate but I, it might be too grown up for young kids but you know my oldest daughter is 10 my daughters are 10 8 and 6 i talk about all of, all of this stuff with them all the time uh don't really go into you know the sexuality stuff but attraction and all that kind of stuff with them all the time and my oldest, obviously, I get into deeper conversations with as she ages. And, you know, I just don't think there's a point when you're, when, when they're too young to start talking about this. The really frustrating part is that most of the time when a woman is trying to get a, a, a to help, help a daughter escape the things that she's went through, that she's gone through, she just tries to not let the daughter see her own securities own insecurities. And I think that that's not proactive enough. I think you can't just not show a kid 
or not say in front of your kid that your butt's too big. They're going to pick it up in you anyway if you feel that way. But you've got to talk to them. You've got to have conversations with them. You've got to preempt that. You can't wait until they come to you and say, some boy at school told me I was fat. You have to talk to them and tell them, look, this is what I've gone through. This is what I've dealt with. This is how I'm trying to change it. Be honest with your kids. Tell them, you don't have to do this. This is, it's silly. I, these are the things that I'm doing for myself now to fix this. And I wish I knew all this stuff when I was your age. Maybe together, you and I can always work on trying to be confident women who are happy in healthy bodies, women who focus on health instead of aesthetics, because healthy bodies always look amazing by accident. And when I say healthy, I don't mean like the medical definition, just not sick. I mean, like truly peak health, like living with vitality, that it, those bodies always look better than their unhealthy counterparts or even moderately healthy counterparts. And I mean, conveying that to a, to a young girl at an early age, talking with them, having these conversations instead of sitting back hoping they don't end up like you is so, so important. I think that, I think we can do some amazing things for the next generations, but um, I haven't quite figured out the delivery model yet. I'm still working on it. I guarantee I'm gonna get that out it, within my career. Don't know how long it's gonna take me, but I, I've got more research to do to figure out how to reach these kids. You know, I'm a, I'm a 43-year-old male with gray in my beard and a full sleeve tattoo. I, I don't look like the type of guy that can show up at a middle school and have young girls hanging on my every word. So I've got to figure out how to get this message across. And maybe it'll involve my, involve my kids getting a little bit older and helping me open those doors. I'm not sure, but it is extremely important to me. Nothing gets me out of bed in, in the morning more than, than that, trying to help these women you know, the, or these young girls skip what the rest of my clients have to deal with. Yeah, and to talk about that a little bit further, um, I think once you get to a certain age, then the kids look at you as, oh, you're too old, you don't understand what I'm going through. Right. So I, I feel like um, maybe it's more the people in their 20s or early 30s that still have that younger side to them that the kids can connect with more and be mm. like, okay, this is a mentor that I can look up to. It's somebody that um, I can trust, but they're not so old that they don't get it. They were yeah. here not that long ago. I don't know if that's the crowd that needs to start getting this awareness out, but usually it's that crowd that also needs this same work done for them before they are able to pass that on to the next generation. Yeah, and unfortunately, they are probably the hardest crowd to reach. The, um, the, the women in their, in their twenties, the, 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 the college crowd and the single crowd, they're the hardest to reach because they, they want quick fixes. They don't have enough failures or, or perceived failures under their belt to be frustrated enough to listen. When you tell them, what if we don't focus on trying to get your pant size down first? They're thinking about this weekend when they go out. The other thing is, is that Alcohol is just part of our culture when you're single and these women that these young women that don't feel very good about themselves and don't really like the way their bodies look are oftentimes using alcohol as the way that they can release some, you know, let go of some of their inhibitions and go out and be around other people their own age in that dating scene, everybody, you know, doing the mating dance and basically not feel terrible about who they are and their own skin. So the insecurity feeds into that. And when you tell them, look, you're probably going to have to not drink on that much of a regular basis in order to be able to, to get the results that you want. They're like, sorry, I'll just go run some marathons and try to run this fat off or starve this fat off and do things that aren't going to be healthy, a healthy path to them getting uh, you know, long-term results. It's everything is short term. So typically what we see in, in women in their early twenties is that they are actively breaking their metabolisms. And sometimes it's working like for in the, in the, in the short term, they, they do look good this weekend, but they're setting themselves up for that rest of their life when they're going, I wish I could just get back to what I looked like when I was 22, except if they think really hard when they were 22, they didn't like their bodies then either. That's another thing that's so common is how many women say to themselves, I wish I could get back to, to age X when my body looked like this. And when you go, yeah, did you love your body back then? They're like, 
like, uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't like it then either. But I would like it this time. This time would be the exception. And so um, that it's, there, it's really, really tough to get to that. I have very few followers in the ages of 20 to 25. Very, very few. So um, it usually, unfortunately, it just, they ha- women have to get way more frustrated before they get to me. But on the physical side, that makes it rough because they do more crazy things to try to lose the weight. And that does more metabolic damage. And then it makes my job harder. You get slow thyroids, you know, metabolic rates being turned down by the thyroid energy levels, of course, are all over the place. You get bad metabolic flexibility where bodies have a hard time accessing stored fat. Cravings are super high. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's a really nasty sort of, a downward spiral, but, um, but it's not, it's never too late. I mean, when these women come around later on, we, we can, we can, uh, we can really get them some amazing progress, but it's just, it's sad that there's no, there's so little opportunity to help them just skip all of it. Let's talk about a little bit, um, with kids that are unhealthy and they're pretty overweight and then you have parents that want to do something for them uh, to help get them healthier but to not overstep into that boundary calling them fat and to knock them down but to still get them understanding how to become healthier and why it's important to get them to that place how would you go about that well absolutely without question the very 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 first thing that has to happen is you've got to be doing it there's i mean it's it's ridiculous to think you know, there, there are so many people out there that will look at their daughters, for example, and go, sweetie, you'd look good even if you, you'd look beautiful even if you wore a gunny sack. And it doesn't carry any weight when it comes from a mom or a dad who clearly dislike their own bodies and aren't, clearly aren't qualified to tell anybody what attractive is. This kid is gone, uh, uh, mom, I've, when I was little, I thought you were the most beautiful person I'd ever seen. And they're not necessarily consciously doing this, but subconsciously they're going, mom, when I was little, you were the most beautiful person I, I, I had ever seen. And yet I took a picture of you with your phone and you freaked out and wanted it deleted. And now you're going to try to tell me that you know what beautiful looks like. And so you've got to, you have to be showing them that you're confident, that you're capable of loving your body, but more importantly, that you're capable of treating your body with love and compassion, the way your behavior around your own body. So if you're not trying to be as healthy as you can, you're not making good food decisions, you're not bypassing bad decisions and making good ones, letting your kids see you make those choices. Yes, there's pizza right there. Yes, there are burgers right there. Instead, I'm going to choose this. If you're not doing those kinds of things, it doesn't matter what you tell your kid. But then beyond that, you just never talk about aesthetics with a kid like that. You never tell them you need to lose weight. You say things like, we need to be healthy. We, not you, we need to be healthy. This is how you make decisions to make your body healthy. This is why we make those decisions. We want to feel good. We want to perform well. We want to not have to ask our body's permission to do the things that we think are fun in life. And then we want to carry ourselves with an air of confidence that is really hard to do without a body that you believe in, a body that you know will be there for you, a body that you know can handle anything you throw at it, even when life gets really stressful. We need to be able to have this air of confidence about us that says, I am a capable, healthy, happy human being, not I'm a human being who looks good. And so when, when those are the messages that are being handed to kids from a young age, I don't think it's that difficult to instill, but it doesn't, I'm telling you like 10 or 20% of it is going to be about what comes out of your mouth when, in regards to what you're telling your kid to do all the rest of it will be how your example, that'll include things that come out of your mouth about the decisions that you make about the things that are important to you about how you want to live your life when you explain that to your kids. But when you say you should do this and you should do that, they're going to listen to about 10 or 20% of that in the total of the message when compared to the 80 or 90% that you will give them through example. 
So in these type of situations, would you want to avoid words like we're going on a diet and talk more about we're going to start eating healthy or is there a different, Certainly. even a different approach to that then? No, I just think you nailed words. it. I think, yeah, I think you just say, saying that you want to be healthy is the way to go. I think that, um, the, the word we're going on a diet is a, that's an interesting one anyway. It's one that like, isn't it funny how only humans use diet as a verb? Like, <laughs> that's I mean, so true. Like if you're talking about like, a, you know, a, a bear, if you were a zoologist, you could name, you could list all of the foods that, 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 that bear over there eats. And that would be called that bear's diet. And that's a noun. That's a, that's a thing. That bear has a diet. There's no bear that's going to go do a diet to go to their, you know, bear high school reunion. So, um, yeah, d stay away from those, those types of terms that society has turned into this, um, answer to the fact that I'm not pretty, you know, I've, I, you don't look good. So you're going to go on a diet. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of dieting. If you're going to go on a diet, it's because you are fat and we all don't like that. And that's a ridiculous idea. It's a ridiculous notion. So yeah, talk about health. Health is the means to this anyway. Like I said a minute ago, they're super healthy bodies always look great, except that they look great. And then they have 10 other amazing, 20 other amazing things going on too, instead of just looking smaller. So yeah, get preach health to your kids, teach them that they say things like, um, if they bring up the aesthetics, like, like, you know, they want to know why people get fat or why people, uh, some people are judgmental when people are fat, things like that. You just steer that back to healthy bodies look great by accident, but that's not ever going to be the point. There's all of this other amazing stuff. You, you can, you can look great and not have to focus on it. It isn't worth focusing on. What's worth focusing on is the things that add vitality and actual happiness to your life. So Jason, we are getting close to time, but I do want to delve into um, the realm of meditation a little bit because you've mm -hmm. mentioned it a few times. And what type of meditation do you use to get people started on this um, uh, journey to their body image and awareness? And how can people get started today? Well, there are meditation instructions in Body Beliefs, and Body Belief, the digital copies for Body Beliefs are actually free. The book has a five-star rating on Amazon, and we sold a ton of copies of it, and recently I decided that I was going to, it was just the message, and it's too important, so I'm giving the digital copies away for free. People can go to altshiftdiet.com slash bodybeliefs, and they will get the book, a PDF of the book for free. There's meditation instructions in there, but I, the meditation that I prescribe is not about relaxation. It is about mindfully noticing and then learning to control thoughts. So it's breath meditation. You're going to sit down, focus on your breath. Your mind's going to wander. When your mind wanders, you're going to pull it back to your breath. When you're first getting started with this, your mind's going to wander. You're going to notice it wandering. You're going to tell yourself how dumb this is, how bad you are at it, how other people are probably better at it than you. There's a whole dialogue you're going to go through. And then you're going to learn to start just pulling yourself back to your breath. And basically what that is, every single time your mind wanders and you pull it back to your breath, it's like doing a bicep curl for your mindfulness. It's teaching you that, hey, look, I can notice myself thinking and then I can come back to whatever I want to come back to, whatever my focus is, and you learn that you're capable of controlling your thoughts. You're lear you learn that you're capable of getting out of the stream of thoughts when things happen like you're walking down the street, you look over, you catch your reflection in that building over there, and you decide you don't like the way you look today, and then instead of it being two hours of self-abuse, you can go, what? And what did, how is this productive? I'm just walking down the street. Nobody ran up to me and went, you look gross today. I just th had a thought. It's just me thinking. And I've taken that thought and I've molded into a club and then I put spikes on the end of that club and now I'm beating myself over the head with this thing and nothing happened. Nothing changed. This is an unproductive way for me to spend my time. I'm going to think about something else. 
And it's like returning to your breath, except that you can return to anything productive or you can go think about, you know, a funny part of your favorite movie or what your, the name of your dog when you were six years old or something that's actually worthwhile in today that doesn't have to do with you just beating yourself up in a situation that nobody could observe. There's nothing observable. If some anthropologist was watching you from behind a, a human blind, like a duck blind, they wouldn't be able to write in their notes. And this thing happened, and then this creature became stressed out. All you did is think. You thought some thoughts, and now you've convinced yourself that something is true, and now you're miserable. And the idea is to be able to control those kinds of things. It's also to give, you, to give your, your goals a voice in those moments when you're reaching out for that cookie because you had a crappy day. If you can be mindful, you can stop yourself and go, wait a minute, has this ever worked? You know, my boss is a jerk. Last week I came home and ate a bunch of cookies because my boss was a jerk. Did he suddenly stop being a jerk? Like what, what was the outcome here? I ate some cookies and nothing got any better. But on the other side, my goals of looking and feeling and performing better and sleeping better and all that stuff, sex drive, skin, hair, like all the digestion, all that stuff, all of that gets interrupted. So on this other side, the only thing I'm going to say is yum. Yum is the only benefit that I get and it lasts for only a few seconds. Is that worthwhile? When you've got mindfulness to stop you in your tracks, you can actually give your goals a voice and decide if these th silly things that your inner voice is telling you are worthwhile. So it's sort of a active and sort of aggressive form of meditation that I preach uh, that does help certainly with stress management, but to the degree that we use it to apply to the cognitive therapy that we're working in our own lives. Awesome. I love this. This is such <laughs> great information. And I love that you're um, basically handing out your book for free because it's so important for you, which brings a lot of passion just to this for yourself. So this is great. Yeah. Where can people find you on the internet? You have obviously your body beliefs book that you're handing out for free on your website and your website's altshiftdiet.com. Mm -hmm. Where else can people find you? We have an Alt Shift Facebook group, a uh, fairly substantial group there. Um, the email list, um, that my email list on my site is the best way to keep up to date. I don't spam. I send out, I don't write blog posts anymore. Instead, I write emails because I want to get them to people that actually want them. And I know that, that, uh, if, if you're on my email list, you can easily unsubscribe. So if you're on the list, you must actually want to know what I've got to say. So I, you know, probably three out of four emails that I send out, sometimes around once a week, oftentimes less than that. I just send out informational uh, emails that give you my best advice in the moment or things that I've been thinking about lately. And then maybe one out of four, I tell you kind of what I've been up to and uh, what, what we've got going on coaching programs, places elsewhere where I can help you. And uh, that's those are probably the best places to stay abreast of, of what I do. Um, I'm not, I used to be much more active on social media, but it's, um, I, it, it didn't pan out to be the benefit that I would have wanted it to be in order to counteract the idea that, that social media is so, so terrible for women. And I don't want to be a part of keeping them on social media. So I don't really have a problem with the Alt Shift Facebook group because if somebody so chooses, they can just get the groups app off of Facebook and not be exposed to all that social comparison, but still get all the information from other Alt Shifters there. But uh, yeah, those are those are the best ways to find me and get more information. Like I said, go to altshiftdiet.com slash body beliefs, get the book and read it because it's free. And if you get 1% benefit, you will be 1% more likely to succeed at your fat loss goals. I, I don't, there, there's no reason for you to not do it. I'm giving it away for free. There's no catch at all. I mean, you are going to have to give me your email address to get it. But like I said, you can unsubscribe immediately. There's no catch at all. I'm literally just giving this thing away for free. Go read it if it helps. And you know what? Go to Amazon first and look up Body Beliefs and read the reviews there. It's, it, it, there, I think there's 63 reviews right now and it has a five star rating. So, free with no, att no strings attached means I really want you to read it. That's what it means. So do that for me. means it's also a really good deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, Jason, thanks so much. One of my goals with this podcast is to start to reach out to that younger generation. I work a lot with uh, middle and high school kids with various sports, so hopefully Mm. we can get this type of information out to them a little bit more, and hopefully um, parents that are listening to this can start talking to their kids about this stuff as well. So That'd be great, yeah. All right. If you want to find out more about Jason Saib, go to altshiftdiet.com. And if you go to altshiftdiet.com slash body beliefs, then you can download the free version of body beliefs. And if you enjoyed this podcast, then please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel. And if you're on iTunes, please go ahead and leave a review and a rating. And that helps our show out and gets the show out to more people. And we will talk to everybody next time. Okay, after the episode, Jason and I spent some time talking, and if any of you decide to take this information and run with it and have any kind of roadblocks that you run into or find any ways to be successful by spreading this message to the younger generation, then please send any of that information my way so that Jason and I can come back later on on another podcast and talk about how we can systemize this in a way to reach more of the younger generation. So if you would like to send it to me, you can either leave it as a comment or you can send it to brian at summitforwellness.com.